fourth class lecture. This is the branch of dentistry concerned with the facial growth, development of the dentitions and occlusions, diagnosis, interception, and treatment of occlusal anomalies. So it is a branch of dentistry which is dealing with the correction of irregular teeth. So orthodontics is derived from the Greek words, which is orthos means correct or straight, and odont means tooth or teeth. So ortho is the prefix, while odont is the root, and x is the suffix. Aims and objectives of treatment. There are three aims and objectives, which is functional efficiency, structural balance, and aesthetic harmony. Jackson's divided the face into triangles, and his aims are the aesthetic, harmony, and stability and structural balance. And the third is the functional efficiency. While Rydell, his aims are the beauty, utility, and stability. Orthodontics can improve the dental health, also the function, and psychology. The dental health, such as the dental caries, malalignment of the teeth may reduce the potential for natural teeth cleansing and increase the risk of decay. Well, also, the periodontal problem can occur if there is irregular teeth. Also, trauma from malocclusion can happen to the teeth and surrounding structures. Also, impacted teeth can may affect the normal position and health of the adjacent teeth in addition to the loss of function of the impacted tooth itself. Also the functional regarding the mastigatory functions can be affected and the speech problems and also temporomandibular joint can be affected. From the psychological point of view an attractive dentofacial appearance may affect uh, and produce a negative manner on expectations for the of the teachers and employees. So the orthodontic treatment can improve the psychology of the patient. The scope of orthodontic of uh, the scope of orthodontics. Alteration in the tooth position, also alteration skeletal pattern and alteration in soft tissue pattern. Some important definitions. Occlusion, any position or relationship in which the upper and lower teeth come together. While the ideal occlusion, it is a theoretical concept of an ideal arrangement of the teeth within the dental arches combined with the ideal interarch relationship, which constrains optimal aesthetic function and stability of the dentition or supporting structures, but it is almost never found in nature. Normal occlusion. The occlusion which satisfies the requirement of function and aesthetic, but in which there are minor irregularities. Andros concluded six keys for normal occlusion. He did a survey on persons in 1972 and he concluded a six keys for normal occlusion. Key number one, which is the molar relation. Key number two is the crown angulation or correct crown angulation. Key number three is the correct crown inclination. Key number four is the no rotation between the teeth Key number five, there should be no spaces between the teeth. And key number six is that should the patient should have a flat or slight curve of his pain in his dental arch. Key number one, which is the molar relation. The distal surface of distal buccal cusp of the upper first molar made contact with the, or occlude here, the distal buccal or distal buccal serve cusp slope of the distal buccal cusp of the upper first molar occluded with the mesial, mesial surface of the mesial buccal cusp of the lower second molar. 
So that the major buckle cut of the upper face molar occluded with the major buckle development of the groove of the lower face molar, which means the angle class one. Okay. The T number two, which is the crown angulation. Angulation refers to the long axis of the crown, not to the long axis of the entire tooth. Long axis of the entire of the crown, not the entire of the tooth. The gingival portion of each long axis of each crown was distal to the incisal portion. This gingival portion should be distal to the incisal portion, varying with individuals and uh, the tooth type. The long axis of the crown of all teeth except the molars is identified to be the mid of the middle portion of the labial or facial surface of the teeth which is the most prominent part and center most vertical portion of the level or buccal surface of the crown here. A key number three, which is the crown uh, inclination. The crown inclination refers to the labial lingual, labial lingual here, the labial lingual, the uh, inclination of the long axis of the crown, not to the inclination of the long axis of the whole tooth. So the inclination of all the crowns has a constant scheme. Usually for the anterior teeth, the labial inclination of the upper anterior teeth, upper and lower, is sufficient to resist over eruption, is sufficient to resist over eruption. While the upper posterior teeth, a palatal crown inclination existed here. The palatal crown inclination usually existed, existed in the upper posterior crown, which was constant and similar from canine, usually similar from canine to the second premolar, and was slightly more pronounced here or slightly more pronounced in the molars region. For the lower teeth, for the lower teeth, usually, for the lower teeth, the lingual inclination of lower teeth, for the lower teeth, the lingual inclination in the lower posterior teeth progressively increases from canine, I will demonstrate it in the next slides, usually uh, increases from canine through the second molar, progressively increases in the lower. Regarding key number four, which is, should be no rotation in the teeth. No undesirable rotations. Rotated molars and bicuspid occupy more space, while rotation of the anterior teeth occupies less space. Key number five, there should be no spaces between the teeth. There should be tight contact between the teeth. Key number six, which is the occlusal plans. The plan of occlusion varies generally from flat to slight curve of a spade. They should be during or after the end of orthodontic treatment, there should be flat to slight curve of a spade. And no curve deeper than 1.5 mm at the region of the second premolar is accepted from the standpoint of occlusal stability. So always, always, always there should be a flat curve of a spade or a slide, which is not more than 1.5 millim on the second premolar. Malocclusion. The usually any deviation of no, from normal, which is which is normal or ideal occlusion. Molar rotation, as we said, the buccal cast tip of upper first molar should include the major buccal developmental group of the first molar. The crown inclined angulation, usually the crown angulation, the distal portion for the incisal should be more distal than the incisal portions. This is very important for the anterior teeth. Okay. Uh, the usually, 
the long axis of the mona crown is identified by the dominant vertical uh, groove in the mid of the labial surface, uh, facial surface of the molars or buccal surface of the premolars. This is the crown angulation. Crown inclination. Usually, a crown inclination uh, refers to the labiolingual, labiolingual or uh, buccolingual inclination of the long axis of the crown, not to the long axis of the whole tooth. For the anterior teeth, the labial inclination of the upper anterior teeth and lower is sufficient to resist over eruption of upper and lower teeth to allow proper distal positioning of the contact points of the upper teeth in their relationship to the lower teeth, permitting proper occlusion of posterior teeth. For the upper posterior teeth, usually the palatal crown inclination exists in the upper posterior crown was constant and similar from canine to the molar. And uh, usually uh, it was uh, constant, as we said, from canine to the second pleura and was slightly more pronounced in the molar region, more pronounced here, as we said, constant from canine to the premolar and more pronounced in the molar region, upper molar region. For the lower posterior teeth, the lingual crown inclination in the lower posterior teeth progressively increases from canine, progressively increases from the canine to the second molar. For no rotation between the teeth. There are no undesirable rotation. Rotated molar and bicuspid usually occupy more space than normal, while rotated incisors occupies less space than normal. The key number five should be no spaces and it should be a tight contact between the teeth. I think key number six, there should be a flat curve of space so that flat or slightly uh, curved, but not deeper than 1.5 at the region of the second premolar. So these are the solution. Regarding the vertical overlap of the teeth, regarding the vertical overlap of the teeth, usually you took previously the overjet and overbite uh, as a definition the overjet and overbite usually the overjet is the anteroposterior relationship between the upper anterior teeth while the overbite is the is vertical overlap or superior inferior relation between the teeth the incisal over bite and overjet. The overjet, the, it is the horizontal distance here between the upper and lower incisors in occlusion, measured from the, usually, from the tip of the upper incisor to the labial surface of the lower incisors. It is dependent on the inclination of the incisor teeth and the anthroposterilation of dental arches. In most people, there is uh, a positive overjet. That is to say, the upper incisors is in front of the lower incisors, normally two to four million. But the overjet may be reversed. Sometimes the overjet may be reversed, such as this, which is called a negative overjet. While here is the edge to edge, means the upper incisal edge occludes with the lower incisal edge. Here the normal overjet, here the reverse overjet, and here is the edge to edge. Usually, here it is called normal overjet, which is normal anteroposterior horizontal relation. Well, here is the normal 
vertical overlap. So the distance between incisal edge of the upper incisors to the lower incisal edge. If it is in vertical direction, it is over by. If it is uh, the distance in anthropocene relation, which is the overjet. So the overbite, it is the vertical distance between the tips of the upper and lower incisors inclusion. It is governed, governed by the degree of vertical development of anterior dentoalveolar segments. Ideally, the lower incisors contact them, usually lower incisors contact the middle third of the palatal surface middle third of the palatal surface of the upper incisor inclusion, which is two to four milli. But there may be an excessive overbite. There may be an excessive overbite. Means that there is more than uh, two to four milli. So the lower incisal edge exceeds the middle third of the palatal surface of the upper incisor. So it becomes more than two to four million vertical overlap, which is called deep bite. Okay. Sometimes the upper incisal edge and lower incisal edge during centric occlusion, these are all of them during centric occlusion and centric relation of the jaws. Sometimes the lower incisors pass the level of occlusal plane but there, there will be no contact between the lower incisal edge and palatal aspect. So when the level of lower incisals pass the level of upper incisals and there is no contact, it is called incomplete overbite. Here, the lower incisal edge not pass the level of upper incisal edge. So when the patient occludes his mouth, his mouth is opened, widely opened. This is called often bite. Here it is overjet, here it is deep bite because it exceeds the palatal aspect. Here the lower incisal edge passes the level of upper incisal edge but there is no contact so it is called incomplete overbite. Here there is no contact between lower incisal edge and upper incisal edge and the level of incisal edge not past the level of upper and there is no contact so it is called open bite. Thank you very much for your kind attention for the, this lecture. Thank you very much for our kind attention.